Videos, videos, videos. I think that sums up the past few weeks pretty well. Um, you know, we got some of this on Prince Caspian, but like practically none on Line the Witch in the Wardrobe. I think it just shows how the times are changing. Or on Line the Witch in the Wardrobe, we were pretty much completely dependent on, um, you know, on the, the press or uh, Disney Walden releasing something in order to see footage. I think the first footage we saw was, I can't remember exactly, it was either a Disney Channel movie surfer clip where they showed just a glimpse of the Pevensies in their four coats, and then we saw some of Edmund wearing his robe, I remember. Then finally in December we got the Weta Workshop video, and that was the big, they really are making this movie kind of thing. And um, But here, you know, Fox and Walden haven't released anything official, and we've all, we're already getting dozens of videos, most of them uh, really high quality videos, looks at the Don Shredder set. And uh, so just look at how the world has changed just in five years. And uh, so I'm just going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but just the ones that um, caught my eye the most and I think are the most interesting. Uh, it's uh, someone named Tamara is responsible for uh, most of the videos and the highest quality ones and perhaps the most interesting ones too. And, uh, and if, you just, if you just look at narnyweb.com, we don't not always post all of the videos because a lot of them are kind of sort of repetitive, but whenever there's something like, oh, there's something new here we haven't seen before, we post that one. So, But we've reached that point to where um, you really do have to check the homepage every, uh, like, every day because there's always something coming out. Just recently, we posted seven videos um, that went on almost at the same time. But anyway, uh, one that came out uh, some time ago now was what has been dubbed the dragon attack. Attack might not be the right word because we don't know if the dragon's actually attacking. Uh, Douglas Gresham, uh, shortly after the video was posted, actually it was about a week later, um, confirmed, or according to this report, confirmed that it is in fact Eustace, or Dragon Eustace as we call him, uh, attacking the ship. And Or is he attacking the ship or is he asking for help? That's kind of the debate right now. I mean, maybe Eustace, because his first reaction in the book is indeed, you know, that he's glad that he's a dragon and he has this power, you know, over the others and he can get everyone back and then that quickly turns to, you know, sadness. And that's when he starts being humbled by it. And uh, so I would think it most likely that Eustace, as someone on Ernie Web said, not being the brightest fellow, you know, goes, flies up to the Dawn Shredder basically to seek help and not really realizing how that, how the crew is going to react to that. But uh, one of the big debates from this is why are the crew on the ship? I mean, sure, some crew is going to be on the ship, but now we're, it looks like we're seeing most, if not all, of the crew on the ship. I mean, it's kind of hard to say for sure. And um, Caspian's even on the ship. In the book, they'd be on the island. Why wouldn't they be on the island? You know, why would they be on the ship? And uh, so someone proposed, well, gosh, I hope they're not leaving without, or trying to leave without Eustace. That'd be terrible, you know, as Miraz would say, they're much too noble for that. It's true. I, I would hate that. And uh, so I'll be, interested to, I'll be interested to see, you know, why, why are Caspian and everyone on the ship? It, just seems, it seems like they've altered the structure here a little bit. They've tweaked some things, because for one thing, there's a mast. The mast gets broken off in the storm in the book, and then they come to Dragon Island to repair the Dawn Shredder. And um, so it seems like they've moved some things around here. As far as the idea of doing, introducing drag, Dragon Eustace to the crew this way, rather than how it is in the book, in the book, you know, Eustace just lands on the beach. He seems somewhat aware of how he's going to come across to them. And uh, so he just lands on them, but uh, between them and the beach, so they're forced to go and meet him. And um, so rather than that, they're doing something where, um, you know, they're actually on the ship and he, you know, comes onto the ship. And that might be cool. That might be a more interesting cinematic way of doing it. I just hope it's not a shameless attempt to find a way to squeeze action into the movie. You know, I really, I, you almost get the impression, I just don't want them to look through the book and say, well, are, are there anything here that we can expand on? and, you know, make into an action scene. I mean, there are opportunities. Lewis had opportunities where he could have done action scenes. Like, you know, one that one is mentioned um, before the Pevensies got on the ship, they, you know, the Dawn Trader was, you know, attacked by pirates. And, you know, and, you know, there's opportunities here for action scenes, but Lewis chose not to take them. And the fact that he had those opportunities and chose not to take them, I think it's very telling. You know, it, it, that'd be even more so than if there were just not very many opportunities. They were there, and Lewis intentionally chose not to take them, because that's not what the story's about. It's a character-driven adventure story, not an action story. And uh, so it really depends on what their motivation here is. Yeah, it might just look more interesting. It might be a more interesting cinematic way of doing it, although I would really, I hope they still have that moment where Eustace is crying, and he's got, you know, Lucy sees, you know, the, the, bra the big bracelet he's got stuck in his arm. I hope they still have that. But, uh, you know, this could be good, it could be bad. You know, I'm, I'm not, I haven't really, I haven't really decided yet. And I uh, will see how that goes.
Uh, another interesting video shows uh, Caspian and Edmund having a sword fight. When I first heard that, I kind of freaked out a little bit. But, you know, just like the report says, it does appear to be just a game. You know, there's Narnians around them cheering, and it's just for fun. It's not actual um, tension. Uh, the real issue here for me is that Caspian is using Rindon. You know, at the end of Prince Caspian, Peter hands Rindon to Caspian, and Caspian says, um, you know, I should look after it until you return. Look after it. And I always took it to mean that it was just because passing on swords is a thing you see a lot in the Prince Caspian movie. It's this recurring uh, image you see, people passing on swords or taking swords. And just a symbol of I'm passing on the kingship to you and I'm not going to need this sword where I'm going, you know? And so I always imagined that um, that was just a symbol of Peter after having to go through this journey to learn humility is finally giving up the kingship to Caspian. And I imagine Caspian would put the sword, he would proudly display it somewhere as this ancient artifact. You know, Caspian has his awe and reverence for the old days. Actually using the sword, I used the example on Narnia Web. to me it seems like if you got an actual copy of the Declaration of Independence and said, oh, I need to write a letter to someone, and wrote, wrote, actually wrote something on the back of the, of the Declaration of Independence and sent it to someone. If you had the actual Declaration of Independence, you would probably either lock it away somewhere safely or proudly frame it and display it somewhere. You would treat it with the utmost awe and respect. And the fact that we're not seeing that here, I think it really diminishes such an important idea in the book, the myth becoming fact and awe being such an important part of Caspian's character that we kind of missed in the Prince Caspian movie. There were elements of it, but that's such an important idea. It's really the most, I would say the most important part of Caspian's character, the idea that he has this excitement and awe for the old days. And part of it was because they cut out Caspian's early backstory. Um, maybe they had to, so a lot of it's unavoidable. But that was something they kind of missed in Prince Caspian. And this just is one of those little things that reinforces that. Like, what a cool opportunity they would have here if he was showing this reverence for a oh, High King Peter's sword, a character out of his bedtime stories, you know? And um, so to me, it's just the idea of awe and reverence is not coming through. Now, again, please, I feel like fans keep missing the issue here. It's Sure, we can put the books under a microscope and come to the conclusion. Technically, it would be fine. You know, maybe he could use a sword and reverence would still come through. But is that going to come across to an audience? That's such an important idea. Always think about, if you're going to comment on this, how is it going to come across? Our audience is going to get the message that he has this awe and reverence for High King Peter's ancient sword, you know. You know, that's all, all, that's all about is how is it going to come across. Maybe it would be okay. And yeah, they brought the cordial on board, but only Lucy ever used the cordial, you know. And uh, so that's really the issue here is the res this respect for these. Ar it's really an artifact is what this thing is. And uh, so I, I'm really uncomfortable with that. I'm surprised. I really didn't think this was... I said in, um, I said numerous times, I didn't think this was going to happen. I just thought, yeah, he's giving him the sword, but he's not actually going to use it in Don Treader. So I'm surprised here. Um, hopefully they can find a way to have him use the sword and still get that reverence to come across. I would, I would hope. We'll see. A uh, little thing from here. Uh, an interview with Ben Barnes. He says... i got to hurry up here. But uh, he says that when the Pevensies come to Narnia, they... Um, you know, the Caspian, they kind of, quote, piss on his bonfire. And uh, basically, the implication here is that the Pevensies get there and it's Caspian, it's not a good thing for him. You know, that, or to me it implies that well, he has some plan or something he's trying to do and the Pevensies kind of get in the way of that. As Narnia Barillion was saying, even though it's cliche, why can't we just get along? And we just went through this in Prince Caspian. We just had this whole thing where they learned humility and to get along and yada, yada, yada. And now I feel like we're kind of back to square one, you know. It, it's just really annoying, especially after having to put up with a lot of that. I, and I'm sympathetic to the essence of drama and storytelling is conflict and wanting to create a certain level of tension and conflict, especially in a story that's this episodic. But to me, it just, again, works against that idea of Caspian having this awe and respect of the Pevensies and anything associated with the old days. So I'm not comfortable with that. But, uh... So that's kind of all I have time for right now. There's a lot of videos. Take a look at them. There's a video of Eustace. Oh, um, the sail's finally been revealed, and it looks awesome. It's just so, it's iconically the Dawn Treader. I, I don't know if I could be much happier with how the Dawn Treader turned out. It really has exceeded my expectations as far as design. But overall, I'm very excited to see my favorite book come to life. And uh, I'm hoping that a lot of these things where I have a bad feeling about, I hope I'm wrong. We'll see how it turns out. But ch check the news every day. There's a lot going on.